Welcome to another episode of In Your Business. Today I'm very excited to meet with Zach Parker. If there's an entrepreneur that I want to mirror myself after, it's Zach. And you're going to find out why as we interview today. I think he's doing an amazing job in entrepreneurship and it's way beyond just the business we're going to learn about today. We're truly going to learn from an entrepreneur today. So Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate those kind words. Well, they're real. And I tell you, <laughs> I watch you from afar. and. Uh, from probably the longest I can remember, I actually watched Entrepreneurs, your name was in the mix. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thanks. And, and today, what I want to do is we're going to start with getting to know you, which is what I do on the show. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you, did you grow up in this area? I did. I'm from Richmond, graduated 96 from Richmond High School. Okay. So you graduated mm -hmm. in 96 from Richmond High. You're still in this area. That's right. I know you ventured out a bit. That's right. But when you graduated in 96, um, what happened after that? Did you go to college? I did. Um, so... Filmmaking is what I wanted to pursue very early on, as far back as I can remember, about 10 years old. Started making movies with my dad's video camera, and that's the only thing I very narrow-minded. That's what I wanted to do. So I ended up going to Ball State, um, kind of thinking it was a film school, and I think it's become a, a bit more film-friendly, but uh, it wasn't much of a film school when I ended up getting there. Um, so I ended up having to, long story short, try to carve out my own film school while there. Um, my freshman year, I came upon this new student-run um, production company on campus called Cardinal Filmworks, and they were looking to make their first film, and they were taking screenplays, and so I wrote a short film, and mine got accepted for it, and so um, ended up making that in the summer of 97, and that was like really like my first short film I really took seriously, and uh, that was seen by a new professor who had just transferred over from UCLA. Um, and so he saw that and let me into his, we kind of pulled some strings, let me into his senior level directing class. Um, and then after that, after what would have been my second year at Ball State, he pushed me out west to, uh, to L.A. So I moved out there when I was about 19 years old. You moved to L.A. at 19? Yeah. And, and I got to know about this. What was that experience like? Uh, it was terrifying at first. I don't think I left my apartment for the first two weeks I was there. Now, I was fortunate. My mom has been a travel agent my entire life, and she would take my, my, my brother and I traveling a lot. Uh, she would get a couple free tickets in the continental U.S. like per year, and we get to choose cities to go to. So I never had a fear of travel. Uh, I got to study abroad in Japan when I was in high school. Um, got to go overseas, you know, to visit family in Europe. Um, so that didn't scare me so much about the moving away. But when I got there, I was definitely a little overwhelmed by the size of the city. And what now I'm here, what am I going to do? Um, I ended up, like, getting hooked up with a... Uh, it was a very weird coincidence. Uh, uh, my brother's friend's dad sold sound equipment to a post-production sound house in Los Angeles. And there was this guy that, that worked there, one of the top people there, his name was Dave Udall. Um, he had done sound mixing for a lot of John Carpenter's films, also Jackie Brown, uh, Starship Troopers. So I got a meeting with him just to kind of like, you know, meet with me and talk to me and kind of give me some direction. And he told me, uh, we talked and he asked what kind of films I liked. And I think he liked that I liked older school film. That I talked a lot about Kubrick, talked a lot about Polanski and Hitchcock and people like that. And so I think he was impressed with my film knowledge. And so he had a personal relationship with Roger Corman, who was kind of the king of B-movies, uh, gave Scorsese his first movie, uh, guys like Jonathan Demme, Jack Nicholson his first movie, you know, things like that. And so he basically got me a, a job on um, Roger Corman's TV show he was shooting at the time called Black Scorpion as a production assistant. I'd be working for free, you know, but I was kind of going to school part time, Working as a, I'd been working as a, as a projectionist at the movie theater here in town. Started as an usher, concession stand, but then got it, to, was working projection. Uh, so got a job at an AMC theaters in Burbank, California as a projectionist. And then was going to school and then working for Corman from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. every night on night shoots, second unit on Black Scorpion. And that was kind of the first like real set I ever got on. So you said going to school. So did you transfer mm -hmm. school to? So he, he wrote me, uh, this, this professor, Jim Shasky, wrote me a letter of recommendation for UCLA. So I ended up going to UCLA Extension, which was kind of this professional studies program for people who were already established within the industry but wanted to do something different. Like say you were a writer but you wanted to be a producer or you were an editor and you wanted to get into directing, you know. So it was me. I was 19. And then the next youngest person in my class was, I think, 31. You know, so they were all kind of these established people, but it really was my way of, of networking. You know, I was really wasn't there to, I mean, again, kind of to learn the logistics. I mean, learning directing, learning writing, I don't know if that, those things can really be taught, but the networking, the relationships, I knew that was going to be, 
you know, really important to, uh, to trying to find my way through the film industry. So that's what I ended up doing, was ended up taking mostly then producing classes so I could find people who wanted to be producers so I could get them to produce my things. And uh, that was kind of my strategy. Almost feels sneaky. <laughs> right. <laughs> but smart. Right, right. It, it, it makes it, it, to me, it felt like, why do I want to meet other directors? You know, like, you know, like, that, you're the director. yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Like, that, that, you know, I mean, great for friendships, but not going to help me, like, propel myself forward. I need to meet, meet people who want to be producers because that's what I'm looking for. That's so intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> it truly is. <laughs> so. And, and so, what happens is you just continued from there. Mm -hmm. Take me through your career. So yeah, so I, uh, I was at UCLA for about a year and a half. Uh, again, so Corman's thing lasted about a year and then you know, you, if you make good relationships on a set, you get, it gets you other jobs. You know, you show you're a worker, you know, eventually. I didn't get paid the whole time I was on it, dirt poor. The only time I would eat was on set because it was free meals. You know, we would do 12-hour days so I could get a breakfast, lunch, and dinner out of it, you know, and then that was it. And then I was using my school loans through UCLA to pay my rent and just to, to get by. Um, and so that led to other productions. I ended up kind of, you know, you kind of work your way up the food chain of, uh, of crew. Also, I felt like, okay, if I'm going to be a director, then I should know how to do every job on a set, you know, so that when I'm hiring people, I can speak with them intelligently about what their job's going to be. But also you learn a director needs to be fluent in all of the languages of production. You speak to a sound mixer very differently than you speak to your DP, you know, you speak to them very differently than you speak to your first AD. So I need to learn how to talk to all these people, and the only way I'm going to be able to learn to do that is to do that job myself. And then I'll be able to recognize later when it's being done well if I know what that job is. So I worked as a PA, worked as, you know, in the art department, worked as a gaffer, key grip, camera assistant, you name it, like I, I did it. So. And I know I don't know what all that is. <laughs> I know the viewers are not going to know what that is. Right. However, you do. Yes. And so you mastered it and continued to go. And all the while, I'm working on my screenplay for my first feature film. I'm hustling, trying to, you know, get it into producers, trying to raise money. Um, Ended up, so I had a producer that I'd met at, at UCLA who, was, who said that they had access to all of this money and they were going to get my film made. And I moved back here because I wrote it while I was still at Ball State and I wrote it to take place at Ball State. Uh, so I figured I'd be able to go back to, you know, write what you know. And that's where I was. And so I was writing like a, a little horror film that would take place on the campus. So I came back here to start, we, we, we kind of uh, hired all of our lead actors and I moved back here to start... Um, getting my crew together and get the logistics of shooting there. And then I basically get the phone call one day saying, she's not gonna be able to find the money, you know, and there, there's nothing there. So then I kind of realized after that terrible phone call, okay, like I can't expect somebody else to get my movie made. It's my responsibility to get my films made. So I decided to learn how to produce myself. Um, so I took the next year to produce a short film that I made and then a short film that a friend of mine made too. And then the one that I made ended up getting into a festival. Uh, so Sundance, there's the Sundance Film Festival, but then there's about 20 festivals that play the same time as Sundance in Park City, uh, Utah. Uh, so I had kind of a relationship with somebody. I, I'd actually done projection for this festival called Slam Dunk, which was ranked the number three at the time. Sundance, Slam Dance, Slam Dunk. You know, okay. <laughs> there was no dance. There's trauma dance. There's everything. You know, um, so I. Uh, had a relationship with them. I sent them my short film, and it played there um, the next year. So this would have been January 2001. Um, and basically after that, I would kind of proved to my family and friends back home here that this was something I was very serious about, but also might be something that could be attainable. Because, you know, you come from Richmond, Indiana, like nothing could be further away than Hollywood, you know, right, filmmaking, right, right. especially, you know, pre-internet or anything too. You know, the world felt much larger at that point. Um, and so I was able to scrounge up about $12,000 over the next few months to make my first feature, which I then went back to Ball State set up a collaboration with them to be able to use students on the film, you know, brought in a few lead actors from Los Angeles as well, and then we made my first feature in the summer of 2001. So I would have been 21, 22 at the time, yeah. I'm glad you said that, because <laughs> I was going to. I mean, you know, yeah. you just described a lot, a lot of activity right. between being 19 and 21, mm -hmm. and it made it feel like you were 28, okay? <laughs> but, but yeah, you're 21 years yeah. old. Right. You know, I mean, just you have your blinders on, you have that, that tunnel vision, this is, this is what I want, and that's all I could think about. All I was working toward, you know, was getting this first film made. And it took a lot longer to get it finished because, again, this was this transitional time and the digital era was just starting, but the technology wasn't great yet. And the technology that was good was very expensive. You know, you've got Lucas doing The Phantom Menace, you know, on digital, you know, but those are $100,000 cameras. There's no way I'm getting access to those. So um, there's a few, like, little 
consumer, slightly more, you know, inexpensive cameras that were coming out, you know, so that's what I was able to get a hold of. And, you know, I go back and look at it now, it's very hard to look at, but, uh, and then getting into editing and then, you know, just, just, there was a lot of like, um, software couldn't really handle the kind of, uh, this space you would need for doing a feature. It was just like it was, the technology was being developed as we were going through post-production. So it took like a few years just to get the film edited and, and then get it burned onto a DVD, which took four different softwares at the time. One to encode, one to make a DVD, one to author, one to burn, you know, like all of these different things. Then find a computer that could actually burn a DVD so you could send to people. So yeah, it wasn't a great time in terms of the technology. Try to find one today that can play it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no kidding. Right, exactly. I have a whole bunch of DVDs at home <laughs> from the show. But, but yeah, so, yeah, so even beyond that, you made a, you, didn't you make one of your early ones here in Richmond? I've made them all in Richmond, actually. I've made all four of my features in and around Richmond. Um, okay. I mean, Ball, even we did a few days on the first film in Richmond, like four days here. Mostly Ball State, but the second one was entirely in Richmond, and then uh, the third and fourth was a little bit of Connersville, like hospital over there, you know, um, gun shop over in Centerville, you know, but, and then the last one was pretty much just Richmond, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and now gearing up for the fifth. So this will be my first time branching out of Richmond, you know, and now actually going to New York this time for this one that I'm planning to shoot this summer. So, so in the summer of 23, you're going to be in New that's York right. mm -hmm. filming. Right, that's right, yeah. And, uh, and what does that mean? Is that like a two-week thing? Is that This will be a three-week thing. thing. Um, so we got access to some really good locations that I'm kind of riding around in Manhattan, you know. So, uh, But the thing that gets me really excited about this is we're shooting this one on 16-millimeter film, you know. So this will be the first time I actually get to make something on film film because I just missed film when I got to film school. It was just digital, it just started. Now I got, when on some of those jobs in LA, I, I would get to work on, uh, they were shot on film, you know, but nothing that was ever actually mine, you know, like working as a gaffer where you have the light meter and, you know, you don't have a monitor, you just have a, a camera operator or a cinematographer behind the lens and they're trusting that you're telling them the proper exposure because you're not gonna know until you get that film back from the lab the next day if it looks right or not. So there's a lot of pressure on that, you know, but also an excitement about it too. I can tell, I yeah. can tell how excited yeah, yeah. you are. And yeah. I was really surprised because one day at, at the coffee shop, mm -hmm. you were saying to me that you're gonna use film. Right. And I thought, why? Right. But did I realize well, how excited you are? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's definitely uh, an aesthetic to it that can't be matched with. I think especially, I was talking to your text, we were kind of geeking out out there in the, in the green room about 16 millimeters, which I feel is the most filmic of film, you know? Like 35 is almost too clean. I mean, you can get, there's a lot of digital cameras that can get really close to 35 these days, but, but, but 16 has a texture to it, you know, that, that can't really be replicated anyway digitally. I mean, there's some filters, but you really can't get that, that texture, you know, through digital. Um, and then also, why do something on film? Not, not only do I think that the story itself is kind of, which I want to have a very 60, late 60s, early 70s kind of tone to it, um, so that's necessary film, but every, every movie that ever m made me want to be a filmmaker was made on film, mm -hmm. you know? And to ever feel like really a part of that community, I want to make something on film. Well, you're yeah. definitely a part of that community, yeah. <laughs> I believe, okay? So we need to transition just a yes. bit, though, because I want to get to the business that yeah. you're in today, right. but I also want to know what happened because after 21 years old, 22, 23, 24, mm -hmm. making these films, your early right. films, mm -hmm. you've had quite a career and quite a path. I mean, you've lived in probably several major cities. So yeah, I was in Los Angeles for about a total of five. So after I shot the first one, I moved back to Los Angeles. Um, and then I was there for a few years and then ended up moving to Chicago for a few years, um, trying my hand there, you know. And that was the interesting thing. The thing about LA is that, you know, like even though it's where the business of film takes place, you've got millions of people trying to get their foot through the same door, sure. you know. So like, and things were starting to up, open up in the independent world with, with digital technology getting better that you didn't necessarily need to live in Los Angeles or even a big city to make a film. Now, when you're done with it, you need a place to take it. And that's where you need those resources. But I felt like I'd met a few people, enough people where I could probably branch out a little bit and get a little closer to home. And that, again, I'd have an easier time raising money in a place where nobody's raising money to make films. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up getting back to Indiana and that's where I ended up making the, the next three films and then starting a family and all of that too. Um, but after my fourth film, uh, Proxy, which premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, which was a very big deal, we sold it to IFC Films, got a distribution deal around the world, fantastic, and signed with an agency. And then I got introduced to the studio world, you know, where I'm doing tours at Paramount and Sony and Warner Brothers and, you know, and all that stuff and being sent scripts. And I learned really quick, I don't 
like this part of okay. it. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so right. I don't fit into this part of it, you know? So I ended up getting a little frustrated with, with filmmaking after that. Like, I love movies, I love filmmaking. The film business is fickle, you know? So, um, uh, I, it, it got kind of bittersweet because there was a, a bunch of times it got close with something big or something I wrote and then it didn't happen and then it didn't happen because again I started depending on other people to get my films made. Um, and then, you know, then I just kind of realized that, you know, I didn't want to be losing time with my kids. I have three kids. I had to, you know, I didn't want to uh, miss them growing up. Um, and so that's when I started looking like, what else can I do? You know, um, along the journey of filmmaking, one of the best film festivals I ever went to, and one of the best parts of making movies is going to film festivals. You know, yeah. people who love cinema get to be with audiences who love cinema. You know, and get to meet filmmakers from around the world. It's it's incredible. So one of the, the fa my favorite ones I ever went to was this one called Fanispo in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. So I've been there twice. Um, and when I was there the first time, they took me to a coffee shop, and I always kind of liked coffee. You know, but. Um, I went there and I couldn't believe how good it was. I'm just like, and I said, like, what's in this? Like, what are the, what's in this? And they're like, there's nothing. It's just coffee, you know. And it's just like, well, why is it so much better than anything else, you know, that I'm having where I live at? Um, so then I got into this weird rabbit hole of research about coffee and espresso and coffee beans and how to make it appropriately and and learning how like places kind of weren't doing it right, you know. So uh, there's a really interesting mixture of science and artistry and making coffee, you know, which is kind of like filmmaking. It's an interesting balance of science and artistry. Um, and so I started kind of going around town and, and looking at coffee shops, was contemplating opening a coffee shop. And then that's how I met Jared Ward, who's now my partner at Roscoe's. He was a part of Roscoe's here in town. Um, and he, he was the one I'd heard because I asked him where did they get their beans from and he roasted them at home by himself. And he and I, we just kind of like got along really well right off the bat and kind of saw that we had that mutual passion in each other. And so long story short, I kind of came onto Roscoe's as this kind of espresso consultant, you know, because he'd ask like, what do you think of our coffee? And I'm like, I think you have everything you need here to make it great except the knowledge. You know, I, I look at your people behind the counter and they just don't know what they're doing, you know. And so he's like, well, would you show them? And so... That's kind of how we got started. Like, well, that seems like an interesting exercise. And, and really what I was doing is kind of dipping my toe into that world. Do I, do I want to have a coffee shop? Is this something I'm really interested in? And I ended up kind of like loving it, you know? So I spent a lot of time there. And, and then within a year or so, the, some of the other owners, the original owners of, of Roscoe's were thinking about stepping away. And they asked me about kind of becoming a partner. And I just jumped right in. And with, within probably a year of that later, 2018, um, Jared and I were kind of full-time partners together at Roscoe's. Okay. And that was kind of my birth into Roscoe's. So, yeah. so you take you from the filmmaking mm -hmm. to the coffee business. That's right. And it brings it from L.A., Chicago, New York, right. but you're right here in Richmond, Indiana. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you're very passionate about that as well. Absolutely. And, and what's really interesting is now Roscoe's had the two locations. They had the depot district mm -hmm. and they had the east side. That's right. Is that when you got involved? Or? I was still, I was involved when the east side was happening. Um, I had a little bit of say in it, but it really wasn't, you know, me. Um, definitely when COVID happened, the, I mean, the east side was, was difficult. That, that property wasn't great. Sure, the property sure. owners lived out of state. We had a lot of pothole issues in the, in the parking lot. We would hear complaints about all the time. I, I never felt that Roscoe's was a drive-through business because right. we're not fast. We're trying to be quality. We're not fast food, you right, know? Right. And uh, I know we tried to really limit the menu in the drive-through, but the customer doesn't want to hear about a limited menu in a drive-through. They want to, so we would just, you know, one order would take five minutes, seven minutes, minutes and that, that's a long wait in a drive through yeah. and so you know like basically just kind of I felt that the east side does really kind of wasn't working out and then plus once COVID happened it really like then it really wasn't working out you right, know right. and so um so yeah so we had to kind of like make the choice to to get rid of it you know so we could really focus all of our energy on one place to try to make it as good as possible sure yeah. and I don't bring that up for yeah. any other reason other than right. to say to you that uh I frequent your shop. You know yeah, that. Right, okay? right, right, right. I'm in there a couple times mm -hmm. a week. We see each other. That's right. And, and what happens is um, I personally think where you're at now in the depot district, mm -hmm. it's the heart of this community. Oh, wow. And, and, and you. so, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s, that's when production manufacturing was all down right. there. Okay. And then we lost that. And in the 70s, we took it into the service. We built up the east side. Right. But the heart of Richmond is still that depot district right. area. Okay? Right. 
Exactly, and that architecture again, that uh, the architecture, the the aesthetic of the building, you know, and the history behind it. That's something that that east side location just didn't have, and I felt like that was part of Roscoe's identity. It felt a little generic to me. Um, and so when, you know, we'd been really wanting to, we'd been renting from the original owners at Roscoe's at the, at the original depot location on Port Wayne Avenue, uh, but we're really wanting to own our own property. You know, we wanted to kind of be the masters of our own domain, you know, and so we started looking around and found this opportunity and, and there was this building, you know, that I felt was sort of this hidden gem within Richmond, you know, I mean, people knew because of Ghislaine and Charlie's and New Boswell back in the day, you know, but there wasn't a lot of attention on this building still. And it's just like, it's this beautiful building, you know, with all of this potential. Um, and what I loved about it was that we could take both sides. So both sort of the, the former, you know, like uh, the side we're on now and then the side next to where we have the tap room at now. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, it's always been in our name, Roscoe's Coffee Bar and Tap Room. Well, now we can literally be the coffee, coffee bar, the espresso bar and tap room, you know? And then also put our roastery in the back as well too so people could see it, which is something we always talked about at the Fort Wayne uh, location was getting the roaster downstairs, but it's noisy, it's smoky. Um, you know, it could be a distraction, even though it's kind of cool to look at. So now we have this opportunity where, we used to, where they used to brew beer at New Boswell to have this pane glass so people can see it on the other side, but not necessarily have be annoyed by it. Mm -hmm. So it just sort of seemed like the perfect fit for us. Um, so I think that the, the original owners of that building weren't really looking to sell. They were looking to just lease us the space, but I kind of pitched them this, this vision of like what we would do with it. And I think that they really, we're looking out for like the building's best interest or what the what it could possibly become um, and opening up that corridor between us and Lisa Cakes which goes all the way down to Lux Lizzie's you know which is just like this great you know no other building in town has something like that right. um, so it just seemed like kind of perfect well yeah. I can tell you that you know my experience of working with entrepreneurs whether it be the students or whether it be the community I hear great things about what you're doing oh that's great and and it's funny because it's not just Roscoe's. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say you own Roscoe's, mm -hmm. your partner and yourself, you know, you do a great job there, but what else are you doing for entrepreneurs? <laughs> That's the thing. Right. That building, mm -hmm. you're doing a great job. It's, it seems like it's in great, you know, condition. Right. If something does need repaired, you repair it. Right. I see you when they're working. I right. mean, you're not, you're not shy. Well, so, <laughs> well, something that was interesting to us is that, like, so there is a, a, a great salon and spa within the building on the second floor and partial of the fourth floor. That kind of came with the cell of the building. Okay. So we are the owners of that salon and spa as well, you know. But the first thing I kind of said is to all of the, all the beauticians and massage therapists, like, listen, we're, you're all, you know, your own business owners. Now, we're not looking to interfere with your business. We're just here to facilitate anything you need, make sure you have what you need to to run your business successfully, you know, but I'm very hands off with all the other business owners because that's how I would want people be, to be with me. You know, they all have their own autonomy. We're just right. there to maintain the facilities for them to make sure they can be a success, you know. So, and then we have the yoga, the yoga um, journey yoga studio in there too, which is fantastic. And so we just have these, a lot of great businesses within there. So I love that it's just a building. Yeah. You said of, of entrepreneurs. Which it is. is yeah. And that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, I've been around the U.S. and I've, I've seen all these different places that have tried to create environments where entrepreneurs come together. Mm -hmm. And it's not always successful. Right. Okay. They want it to be, mm -hmm. but it's not. Whereas yours has been the opposite. <laughs> You've not gone out and said, come right. here and make us this hub. Right. It's just happened. It's just I mean, happened. Yeah, it's kind of organically. We've been very that. fortunate in that way. And now we have this Airbnb that we've, we've, we've renovated one of the apartments on one of the floor and we're working on a second one right now. And so we're trying to create this unique package as well where, you know, if you come and do a stay with us, you get discounts at all the businesses in the building. If you tell us ahead of time, we'll put you in touch with a stylist. If you want to get your hair done, you want to get your nails done, you want to get a massage, you know, like trying to create this nice little package that I don't think any place else in town can kind of offer. So where did you get this? <laughs> You said your mother was a travel agent, right? Right, right. right. Did you learn some right. of this from her? I mean, you know, I guess what people are looking for when they travel, you know, you want amenities, you know, so that's why we call it like an historic building of modern amenities, mm -hmm. you know, so. It well, just kind of I, I know I enjoy it, and yeah. I certainly enjoy you, and I think it's, it's amazing the stuff you've, you've accomplished and you continue to accomplish. Mm -hmm. now, now, you're raising your children here in the Richmond community, mm -hmm. and, and you're certainly giving back to the community through what, all that you're doing every day. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting, and I've mentioned to you mm -hmm. that it seems like your staff mm -hmm. there at Roscoe's are, right. are incredible. They, they are. Do a wonderful they really job. are. Yeah. And you know, when you mentioned the salons and such, and you just want them to be able to run independently, and and it's not yours, mm -hmm. it's theirs. Right. I feel that in a coffee shop as well. Absolutely. I mean, we've been very fortunate with our staff. Again, like we. 
it's important for us for our people to care about the place, you know, but I, I always tell them, you know, that all of their individual personalities is what gives the place its personality. So I want them to be able to express themselves, you know, as, you know, as long as we're keeping it appropriate and everything, because we all, I always have to remind them, don't forget we're serving food here, you know, right, right. but, um, you know, like we always feel like we're kind of a, not only kind of a place for misfits, but we try to be a neutral place too, you mm -hmm. know, like I don't, I don't think you see any kind of like one common denominator demographic at Roscoe's. And that's right, kind of what right. I love about it the most. I want to be a neutral place for everyone, you right. know, so. Well, and I feel like, you know, one of the things I love about being at the university is the students. Right. And I work with students in every way. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is when I do get away from the university, coming to Roscoe's is right. one of my favorites. <laughs> and it, it just feels like I'm right at home there. Right. And I do feel like there's something there for right. everyone. No matter what it is you're looking for, you can find it. And I love hearing that because that's exactly what I was trying to create for myself. You know, like mm -hmm. people always say when you get into filmmaking, people always say, you know, you want to make a movie that you would want to watch. You know, well, I wanted to create a coffee shop that I would want to go to, you know, mm -hmm. and you just hope that there's enough other people out there that kind of have the same mentality. <laughs> well, I think you're achieving what you wanted to do. One thing I would like to ask you, because you've been an entrepreneur, it sounds like, since you were just a young kid. Mm -hmm. OK, what do you enjoy about entrepreneurship? I guess the creation of things, you know, like I, I really like projects. I like to stay busy, you know. I may, Staying productive makes me feel really good, you know. It's tough for me to take, and maybe that's to my detriment as well, it's tough for me to take breaks, you know. I'm not, I can be difficult on vacations because I, I, I vacation poorly <laughs> because I want, when we go, there, well, what are we doing? Well, when we get there, what are we going to do, you know. Like I am always have this need of needing to feel productive in some way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely get a real high from creation, you know? Mm -hmm. And so once a thing feels like it's done or a thing is self-sustaining, then like that's great and I love it and I'll love it forever, but now what's the next thing, you mm -hmm. know? So, so now that I feel that finally, you know, my kids are getting older and Roscoe's is feeling in good shape and the building's feeling, I mean, there will always be the daily little problems, but it's feeling sustainable, it's feeling mm -hmm. stable, you know? So it's time to go make another movie. It's time to go do something else now, you know, so. And that's yeah. happening right. this new summer. New challenges, that's and right. I, I know, you're excited too, yeah. so I'll be yeah. missing you for a few right. weeks right. while you're in New York. Yeah, but then I'll be back here to edit the whole thing, you know, so I always bring it all back here, so, yeah. Well, the fun thing is I'll be in New York in April and I'll be looking around thinking <laughs> this is where Zach's going to be. That's right. So, uh, yeah. thank you for coming on the show. No, I appreciate it, thanks I for having really me. I truly appreciate you being here. Of course, thank so, you so uh, much. This concludes another episode of In Your Business. I'll tell you, I was so excited today to, to just be able to do this interview because from afar, I've been watching Zach Parker since he graduated high school. And I thought it was interesting because back then I really didn't know anything other than a name. I kept hearing stories about what he was doing and I kept thinking, oh, well, let's see how it works. And I feel like it's been all these years later, I'm still watching him and just to see how it works and it works well. And so again, just as I said in the beginning, I'm gonna say again, I love mirroring this entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur in every way, a well-respected entrepreneur. Thank you again for watching In Your Business.